So uh, let's start with a question. So what does chocolate, beer, fast cars, and women's underwear have in common? <coughs> Any ideas? It's attractive. Uh, no, it's the interests of my co-author Kaivan Zakai. Yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily in that order, but uh, no, it's um, these are some of the industries that we've actually uh, looked at in in this book. And in fact, probably the the firm that is furthest along on truly integrating lean and green is actually the one making women's underwear, uh, and it's actually in Sri Lanka. So it's interesting. It's not actually uh, Europe or America. It's a company, and they have the first carbon neutral bra. I, I didn't go into a lot more details than that, but uh, <laughs> Kayvan extensively studied that for some reason. Um, so <laughs> I suppose that that gives us a little bit of background to what we're talking about. Um, so uh, what I thought I'd do for the next, um, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour, something like that, is talk a little bit about what do we think this subject is. And uh, Bjorka, you, you gave a nice introduction there. And um, share some of our sort of thinking on, on this area. Um, and um, I, I guess when you, when you come to this area of lean and green, the first thing is that there's, a, there's a two different things coming together. And what, what we find is that many organizations have been doing lean for many years. So I guess, how many of you have been doing lean for some time in your organization? <coughs> yeah, quite a few. And, and how many have been doing the sort of green environmental side for? It's interesting, everyone over there puts their hand up. These people haven't done anything. I, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, what we find is that some organizations have done lean, a lot of lean, and not much on the environment, and some have done a lot of environment and not much lean, or a few organizations have done both, but if you have done both, it's usually a team over here, and then a team over here who haven't really ever talked to each other. And what we find many organizations, um, so we were working with one uh, manufacturing company, um, just last year and they'd been doing environment and, and they'd done a really good work it was in the food sector and they had you know anaerobic digestion systems and they were producing their own electricity from waste and you know etc etc and we said well have you looked at your energy use of the, your machines and they said no because it didn't sort of fit into the environment bit and it didn't fit into the lean bit. So some really obvious things. So we just went round and did a simple, well, why don't you turn the machines off during the lunch break conversation. And literally it was as simple as that. And they could, took 20% electricity usage out, although both of these were actually quite advanced. And you think, well, how stupid is that? But if you've any done any diagnostic work, you know when you look at yourself, you find lots of stupid things as well, etc. So what we tried to do is we've tried to say, well, how can you bring these two areas together? So there has been a lean and green movement for some years. Um, I suppose it's, it's as, as you were saying, probably more uh, further ahead in, in, in establishing the two coming together in North America than, than probably in, in Europe. Um, in fact, my origins in this area, I was just explaining this uh, upstairs beforehand, is I, I came into Lean about 1991, started working with Lean at that time, spent most of that time working at uh, Cardiff University. And I developed a stage evolution of Lean and the highest level I called something called glean, which is this horrible word, which was G lean, which actually meant bringing lean and green together in 1991. But you, do you know how many people were interested in that? No, nobody. Nobody was interested, because I, I suppose it was 20 years too early. So what we tried to do in this book, and there are a number of books on sustainability and lean obviously, and there's one or two books that have been trying to think about bringing these together. And uh, it struck me and my colleague uh, Kay Van Zakai, who was at Cardiff with me and is now at SA Partners, that with all due respect to our co-authors, the books were actually quite terrible. You know, they weren't very good. So 
we decided to start thinking we actually brought a, lo uh, a number of leading organizations together we invited Hunter Lovins uh, any of you familiar with Hunter Lovins? Natural Capitalism anyway those of you familiar with the, the Green Movement she came over from the States and, and we ran this conference and I suppose the book and a lot of the thinking came out of that, uh, that particular event. So in terms of writing the book we, we decided we'd get two people who were starting from a, a lean side, myself and Kayvan and coming towards the environment and two authors that were starting from the environment side and coming towards, uh, coming towards um, the lean side so that we could see how we could uh, take either direction. So a little bit of my background, um, I've been working as I say with Lean for about 25 years now and um, my impression or approach to Lean revolves around applying this approach which is about aligning the strategy in the organization so everyone's going in the same direction, looking at the end-to-end -end processes not just fulfilling orders but product development, winning business, supply chain etc and then engaging the people so process sorry purpose process and people and then using the right tools and then taking it into a supply chain so this is basically a reverse engineer of work I did in the Toyota supply chain in the uh, mid 1990s and the most recent book specifically around the lean area uh, just like a book advert show here. Da -da -da. You'll notice that there's a slight typo on here. Someone made the mistake of writing this bit in Danish. So this book is actually in Danish. Um, it's also in English, but you know, it is in Danish. Um, and uh, what we wanted to do in the network is let people have copies of the you know, uh, books, etc. So this is more how do you do a classic lean, but you'll notice the topic is sustainable lean. So we were starting to think about sustainability of lean in the economic sense. In other words, stickability. So anyone done any lean projects that have sort of six months later faded away a bit? Anyone got that experience? <laughs> yes, I know my yens will admit to anything. So, <laughs> so um, I think we've all had that experience. So that, that was basically behind this and it won something called a Shingo Prize, which does that mean anything? Some of you. you. You know everything. It's very knowledgeable. David here, he's, he's very knowledgeable over here. So I suppose Lean is about business improvement. I suppose the origins coming out of uh, Toyota and the Toyota production system. But warning, it's not just this bit. This is the key to making it work, the purpose, process, and people. So what you'll see, our, our way of thinking about Lean is a very human-centric rather than tools-centric approach. Green environmental movement, um, imperative for most organizations, trying to bring them together and create uh, competitive advantage and differentiation. Um, I, I guess most of us are familiar with a lot of the research on I suppose global warming is often what it's called. I, I prefer to call it climate change, which is actually probably could be worse than it's not just a warming effect, it's actually uh, differences. So if you look at uh, the, this is sort of temperatures and then it goes through the roof in the last number of years. So this is the book that we put together. So this is Kayvan and myself and uh, Hunter Lovins, who's quite a quite a character if you ever come across her. She, she always wears a cowboy hat. In fact, I think she goes to bed in that cowboy hat. <coughs> and uh, this is uh, Andy Wood, who's our fourth author. And uh, Andy uh, was one of the case studies at the conference that I mentioned. Um, and we included him in the book because Hunter's view that was that was the best case study she'd ever heard. Um, in terms of and what Andy shared. And Andy is the Chief Executive Officer of a uh, regional brewer in the UK, um, which is actually the nearest part of Britain to Denmark. So if you go towards Britain, you will hit East Anglia as it sticks out, and he's right on that very coast there, and makes very good beer as well. <laughs> and he has a carbon neutral beer, 
which isn't very nice, but I haven't admitted <laughs> that to him. <laughs> but anyway, um, and, uh, and so forth. So I'll share a little bit about some of the things that he's done. So what, what we've done is, in the book, what we've tried to do is to take some of our uh, frameworks and knowledge of how to take lean into a whole organisation and to see this as a cultural change journey, not just a few projects and a, and, and, and a few tools here and there. To take that thinking and bring it together with the green environment and say, well, we need to have good ways of strategically aligning everyone in the organisation. So if you go into your organisation and let's say you have a, a philosophy of, of continuous improvement, environmental improvement, etc. Does everyone at the lowest level of the organisation know what you're trying to achieve? Does everyone know what they need to do? Is everyone in the organisation thinking of tomorrow better than today on environment and on lean? The answer is probably no. Am I right? Yes? So that's about strategy deployment. So there's a case around Tesco. Um, around the leadership and people engagement, the case is around uh, Adnams, which is the brewer. <coughs> so what uh, Andy does is he has a public domain document. You can go onto the Adnams website and you can see the scores that all the employees have <coughs> given to all of the senior managers in terms of their leadership skills. It's a public domain on their website, which is no way of hiding if you're going to be that open about how you lead the organisation. So Andy has done some remarkable things. Uh, one of the remarkable things that he's done is he took um, a lady who joined them uh, as a cleaner and he developed her through and she's now the chief operating officer for that business. And uh, she re last year won uh, Best uh, Woman Business Woman of the Year, I think was the terminology. So actually bringing people up right the way through the organisation. Um, supply chain cases um, and also how do you apply this in terms of the toolkit and, and, and process management. So we look at organisations like, <coughs> like Toyota. And... Um, so one of the questions <coughs> I'm sure for all of us is, well, what is lean and what is green? And um, I suppose if I was to simplistically say, there, I've turned it off now. What, 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 if I say, what is lean about, what, what would you say? Reducing waste. Reducing waste. Thinking. Thinking, yes. Customer value. Customer value. Process optimization. Process op okay, I think it's all of these things. I think for most people, the first thing that comes to mind is reducing waste. And I think you're quite right, it's much more than that. And it is about thinking and it is about behavior and, and, and way of thinking. And, and we've worked with the, the Tesco organization for nearly 20 years now. And we've helped them to take this lean into their organization. And they've translated it into three words, which is as an and as well, but better, simpler, cheaper. Better, simpler and cheaper. So better, running the organisation so it's better for their customers and consumers. Simpler, uh, so it's actually easier for people to do their job, so it's good for the people working. And, uh, and, and uh, cheaper, so that actually it's improved the efficiency and, and the financial benefits to the organisation themselves. So I suppose if that's a little bit of what lean is about, we could say lean starts with the needs of the consumer and then we are going down the supply chain and one of the things is removing waste. I think that would be too simple if we said it's only that. And probably most of us are familiar with the seven wastes or eight wastes if you include the human potential one. And then it struck us in our thinking, well what is green about? Well we saw a difference between consumer and society, but the only difference is it's many, one to many. So this is society, but to me they look like lots of people doing shopping sort of thing. And then if we are reducing waste, and I think that's one of the aspects, but I think really this is about thinking and a culture change and, and looking at all the processes. There are other types of wastes 
Now, in the green environmental movement, we might give them different names. You know, they might be greenhouse gases, they might be excessive water usage, they might be pollution, they might be landfill, they might be eutrophication. Anyone know what that one means? Yeah. 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 So excessive usage of fertilizers, and, and and then you get algal blooms, and you know all these types of things. So very good. So the point with that is, well, if this is lots of people trying to get rid of this stuff, and some people trying to get rid of this stuff, you know, really, if we put the whole thing together, that really we could be talking about the same sort of agenda. If we started to think a bit more laterally than the lean people have here and we started to think well if this is what we're trying to reduce are there some knowledge and methods that might already be well existing here uh, to achieve this <coughs> and this is uh, I suppose some some sort of theory sitting behind this that uh, um, lots of people who don't sound like they come from Wales but uh, <laughs> but uh, they do. <laughs> but I don't think any of them originally came from Wales. Um, so this was some of the research that uh, the Macaulay Cavan did with a couple of colleagues from another research centre in Cardiff. And what we were trying to say is, if you think of the evolution of organisations on this journey, that for many organisations they see lean and green as a trade-off. Well, you want more frequent deliveries, though that's going to be more more lorries, uh, you know, or you know that that type of thing. And then, as you go along, people start to say, "Well, yes, it's good to have lean and it's good to have green, and they they're both good, but they don't sort of work together. So they're they're they're, they're friendly, but you know, whatever." And then starting to think about how you could bring them together in one activity or one program of work and, and, and synergistics and then moving on to a fully sort of symbiotic where this is just how we think, how we act and so forth. So I suppose if you look at the cases we've collected in the book they're probably realistically in this sort of area. I, I, I don't think there really is an organisation that's quite got as far as, as this. So if you ask me what does that look like, I think the answer is I'm still uh, working and thinking about that because I think there's further to go than any organisation has, has actually got. But what there is, is there's a lot of information of how you can get to here and I think for most organisations they're probably somewhere in these sort of first two, uh, first two stages. So I thought I'd share an example of an organisation starting with green and some of the work they did and then starting to move in, in the uh, lean direction. So this is the, the Brewer Adnams um, who make uh, classic um, strong ale mm, bottles primarily but you can get it in pubs and so forth. And they started to look at, um, they started to look at how they produced the beer and they started to look at well what's the carbon impact of producing beer and, and having it sold either in a pub or, or in a supermarket etc. So what, what do you think is the biggest impact for beer? Transportation. 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 Packaging. Packaging. Water. Water. What sort of packaging? The bottles, the other stuff to put it in. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts? Heat. Heat. The thing is, it's very interesting. When you look at some of these impacts, it's not always obvious what the big impact is. It, it, my friend here is actually right. It's the bottle. The bottle is by far and away the biggest carbon impact. But it is quite water intensive as, as, as well. Um, so looking at the, the carbon impact of producing a, uh, a bottle, so this would be like a half... Um, litre bottle of beer, you can see 60% of that is actually producing the bottle and going right back to producing the crops. And hence the, the piece of work that Andy started with is saying, well how can I actually take a significant amount of that out? And clearly that means by, well let's start with thinking of the bottle and actually work with the bottle manufacturer and lightweight the bottle was actually the most important thing that they could actually do. So they started to say well where do you think we could uh, make the savings? So East Green um, is their carbon neutral beer although to make it carbon neutral it has offsets 
in there. So it's not completely carbon neutral in the, the true sense, I suppose. Um, and, and it's not green because of the environment. It, East Green is the brewery's opposite a green, a village green called East Green. So East Green Beer <laughs> is why it's called East Green Beer. And uh, clearly the major impact, so if you do the classic lean uh, Pareto analysis, let's start with the biggest impact and work our way back. So starting with the bottle, the bottling process, transport brewing process, and actually the malting and barley production were not that significant, so let's not worry too much. Equally well, we've done work in the wine industry. Are we going to start getting a bit of a reputation here, the wine industry? So we actually were looking at the uh, water's usage in the wine industry in Australia. So where, where, where do you think the big water usage is in making a, a bottle of wine? So washing the bottle? Could be. Ordering? It's actually the irrigation. The irrigation is like 98% of the water. So let's go to the bottle factory and save 5% of the water in the bottle factory. Well, you know, we're, we're not quite wasting our time, but it's close on to it. So actually changing how they irrigate was actually the biggest impact on, on that, uh, that industry. So any, anyone done um, any of the design of experiments work, Six Sigma tool? Yeah, if you've come across that. So it's a, it's a very sophisticated Six Sigma tool that would usually be a black belt. So we did a design of experiments of how you could increase the yield of A-class wine from this wine uh, vineyard. And A-class wine sells at, uh, oh, how can I get this, uh, let's say 4,000 crowns a bottle. Does that sound about right? 4,000. So 4,000, uh, yeah, no, that would be about right. So 4,000 crowns is about 350 pounds. Yeah, so that's how much. So 2% of their crop, and it's all sold in China to people who don't, how can I say, have a long established palate in wine drinking. <laughs> is that one way to put it? But actually, this costs 500 Australian dollars, so, uh, you know, etc. So if you can increase that 1%, you can see the financial benefits was huge. So we did a design of experiments of how, how do you, when do you crop it, when do you water it, how do you prune it, do you, how do you mulch it, you know, you put ground cover, etc., etc. So anyway, just thought, that's not particularly interesting for the talk, but I thought you, you might be interested anyway. <laughs> so, Someone said water, so also reducing the water, they've cut water from eight pints, so eight pints is like four litres roughly, um, by over half, they've now got it down to about 2.5 pints, um, lots of other sort of things. One of the other things they've done is, this is a quarry, you, can, you can't quite see, but you can see that sort of in a dip. So this is their distribution centre. And what you'll notice is that it's got a green roof. So the roof is uh, like a sedge, like a, a plant. So they collect all the water from that to clean the vehicles and for the toilets and, and, and so forth. Um, they've also produced, this building cost 20% more to produce than uh, a typical warehouse. And uh, they made it out of um, lime hemp blocks, was the construction material, um, which actually captured between 100 and 150 tonnes of CO2, so taking a waste and capturing it, rather than conventional brick and block would have created three to 600 tonnes. So they're actually capturing carbon in, in the building. And the building, because of its construction and because of how it's been located, they don't have to heat it or cool it, which means that the beer is kept between 10 and 13 degrees the whole year round because of the location, etc. Which obviously means that within two years it paid for itself and, you know, the costs are very, very low in terms of uh, running it. And you can see the sort of savings of electricity and, and gas compared to a conventional. So this is where Andy came from, this sort of very environmental thing. He took a very good lead in leadership in the organization. And what we've done is work with him to bring some of the, 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 the lean side in as well. And this produced 
a significant increase in, in profitability in the organisation and this not very nice beer. But don't, don't tell him that I mentioned that. It's not very nice. <laughs> um, which takes us on to um, thinking about mapping things out and diagnosis. So I, I guess those of you that